beautiful And every night has a state so magical And if there's love in this life There's no obstacle that can't be defeated For every tyrant to tear for the vulnerable In every loss so the bones of a miracle For every dreamer a dream Everybody in the world has a chance today to say no Monday left me broken Tuesday I was through with hoping Wednesday my end We should be announcing that we're not replacing Trident at all and that we're starting steps towards getting rid of nuclear weapons altogether. Gradually the opinion of people in this country is questioning the whole role of a hereditary head of state. I feel very, very sad that it's a Labour Prime Minister that does so much now to undermine the principles of the National Health Service. It's going to be different and it's going to be better. When is it ever a waste of time to put forward a view you believe in? When is it ever a waste of time to think of a different, better way of running this world? Stand up against racism in any form whatsoever in our society. We've stood in this green on Trafalgar Square and many other places against apartheid South Africa. Eventually, apartheid South Africa was defeated. Everyone who's taken part in this democratic discussion and debate about the future of the defence of this country has a right to be heard. I said, I've got to go now. And I said, Tony, just one question. Why are we doing this? He said, it's the right thing to do. That's why we're doing it. I said, that's not an answer. He said, that. that's the only one you're going to get. Mr. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank all those that took part in an enormous democratic exercise in this country, which in concluded with me being elected as leader of the Labour Party and leader of the opposition. I think we can be very proud of the numbers of people who engaged and took part in all those debates. I've taken part in many events around the country and had conversations with many people about what they thought about this place, our parliament, our democracy and our conduct within this place. And many told me that they thought Prime Minister's question time was too theatrical, that parliament was out of touch and too theatrical, and they wanted things done differently, but above all they wanted their voice heard. And so I sent out an email to thousands of people and asked them what questions they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And I received 40,000 replies. Now, there isn't time to ask 40,000 questions today, and uh, our rules limit us to six. And so I would like to start with the first one, which is about housing. Two and a half thousand people emailed me about the housing crisis in this country. And I asked one from a woman called Marie, who says, what does the government intend to do about the chronic lack of affordable housing and the extortionate rents charged by some private sector landlords in this country? We're off campaigning today. <laughs> How did it feel for you when Labour lost the general election? Very, very sad and very angry at what I realised was going to happen to a lot of people in this country. As I thought the Labour message was not clear enough on the economy, not clear enough in opposition to austerity. And was it that that made you think, right, I'm going to throw my hat into the ring for the leadership election? The left comrades in Parliament decided that um, we had to put somebody forward and they all pointed at me. For six years, the British Conservative Party have been in power, responding to the financial crash by pursuing an agenda of austerity. Their cuts 
have fallen on the poorest. Morning all. Morning. Morning. In Britain's increasingly divided society, Jeremy's very much at home among the people he feels he represents. Teach the Tories how not to be unfair to the poor and just favour the rich. We want Labour. Labour is the best. The distance between the poor and the rich is so big. It is so big. We want to reduce that margin. We love Jeremy Corbyn. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. I'm the world's worst candidate by constituency because I just wander around chatting to people all the time. And I said to spend my whole life doing it. It's interesting because every single person you meet knows something you don't know. <laughs> yes. If you don't interact with people, you can't learn anything. It also keeps you humble. Unpolished and approachable, Jeremy has a powerful appeal as a new kind of leader. Over here, Jeremy. 200,000 people joined the Labour Party simply to vote for Jeremy. It was this new, young membership who swept him into the leader's office in Westminster. Electing a Labour council is the best protection for your community against the onslaught from this Conservative government. I'm galvanised. I'm looking forward to Prime Minister Jeremy Corbyn. I think that'll happen. Well, I'm convinced it's going to happen. Are these elections your first big test as leader of the party? No, the big test of leader of the party is to grow the party, is to make the party more active, is to challenge the party in parliament and to take part in all the electoral contests. And do you think you're doing, succeeding in that at the moment? We're getting a lot of support. Um, the opposition to the budget went very well and the Tories have been exposed to what they are in that respect. So yeah, I think things are going pretty well. Following Jeremy, it would be easy to believe that Labour was about to sweep to victory on the back of his popular support. There's a lot of soul today, again. We'll have to do everybody one leave. Oh, oh, yeah. kiss. <laughs> do you think we can win an election with selfies? Uh, if we can get, you know, 66 million selfies, then yeah. You're so famous. No, not really. Do me a favour. A normal human being doing my jobs. I was being told with great... Um, uh, authority by members of parliament here a week ago that um, we were going to lose at least 300 seats and that it was all down to my fault. Um, in fact, we had a loss of 29 seats and uh, we hung on. So I'm very happy and um, I've been calling various people this evening to congratulate them on their results. When all the votes are in, Labour's net loss is 18 seats but the party wins a larger share of the vote than the government. Jeremy is authentic and popular within the Labour movement. But he'll have to find a wider audience to win a general election and deliver the alternative he represents. You're watching too much television. The whole narrative all day and all last night and all for the past month has been Corbyn's going to lose, Labour's going to fail, Labour's going to lose, Labour's going to fail. There is not one story on any election anywhere in the UK that the BBC will not spin into a problem for me. It's, okay. it's obsessive beyond belief that they are obsessed with trying to damage the leadership of the Labour Party and unfortunately there are people in the Labour Party that play into that. What are you going to do about the fact that there have been people from the Shadow Cabinet today who have come out and criticised you? You see. I'm, I will continue trying to develop the policies of this party and lead this party in a direction that also has a more grown-up approach to politics. I, I am not a traditional kind of party leader. I do things in a rather different way. Some people are slower learning than others. Jeremy Corbyn. Can the Prime Minister explain why he's intent on forcing good and outstanding schools to become academies against the wishes of teachers, parents, school governors and councillors. The reason we want to do this is to improve the standards of education in this country. I would have thought the Leader of the Opposition would want that too, no? He hasn't even managed to convince one of his own county councillors, indeed the Cabinet Member for Education in his own county, who told the press, ah, oh, you might, you might, you might shout. Prime Minister, explain why he is intent on forcing good and outstanding schools to become academies against the wishes of teachers, parents, school governors and local councillors. 
the results speak for themselves. Under this government, there are more pupils in good or outstanding schools. Teachers don't want it. Parents don't want it. Governors don't want it. Head teachers don't want it. Can't you just think again and support schools and education, not force this on them? At the end of the bout, the team checked for the instant result from the political pundits. George Eason says it's his best PMQs. Jeremy, yeah. George Eason was the worst judge of anything, but it was good. So was Paul War. That's good. I'm not going to knock it, I'm just saying. I thought last week's was better, but it was good. Jeremy's become more effective at it. I mean, he's done PMQs in a different way from the beginning, adopted a different, less editorial style of, uh, of PMQs, and I think that's very popular with the public. But I think also the government is in a, a, a difficult position. It's, uh, you know, it's gone through one uh, you know, disastrous series of events after another, and that's hammered home the fact that it's, just, it's not just a government of failure, but it's a government that is deeply unfair to its core. And so all those things happening together um, has put the government very much on the back foot. From the outside, today looks like a good day for Jeremy, but there are very real problems in his team. As we're talking after the interview, Seamus reveals somebody regularly leaks details of Jeremy's questions ahead of his confrontations with the Prime Minister. Well, did someone know what it's about before? This time he did, because it, it leaked. It leaked from that meeting. It's, it's very annoying, because it only happens about a third of the time, but it obviously gives them a little bit of extra time. Whenever there's a leak, it gives them that advantage. And it gives them the advantage on TV as well. I asked my mother. Oh, I think I know what my mother would say. I think she'd look across the dispatch box and she'd say, put on a proper suit, do up your tie and sing the national anthem. Talking of motherly advice, my late mother would have said, stand up for the principle of a health service free at the point of use for everybody. Because that's what she dedicated her life to, as did many of her generation. You must be very proud of Joan. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's a he's a good politician. Is there a is he's it? not very good in house work, but he's a good politician. <laughs> <laughs> Since taking over, Jeremy's had to deal with almost constant criticism from the mainstream media. The one thing I've learned over the past um, six months or so is how shallow, facile and ill-informed many of the supposedly well-informed major commentators are in our media. They shape a debate that is baseless and narrow. In a conversation with Seamus Milne, his head of strategy, it's clear Jeremy sees an article from a leading political columnist as the latest attack. Only the big negative today is Jonathan Friedland in The Guardian. The Jonathan Friedland article in The Guardian. Um, it's uh, it's anti-Semitism. Labour has a problem with anti-Semitism under Corbyn. A utterly disgusting, subliminal nastiness. A whole lot of it, you know. You're a disgusting racist. You say it's not true. You're, yes, you're a lying racist. Really? Why don't you go and check A Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. You're a disgusting Nazi apologist, Livingstone. Anyone that commits any act of anti Semitism is auto excluded from the party and an inquiry follows immediately. When Jeremy's friend and former London mayor, Ken Livingston, says Hitler supported Zionism, things completely fall apart. Friends from Hezbollah will be speaking. I've also invited friends from Hamas to come and speak as well. Now, Hamas and Hezbollah believe in killing Jews. If he wants to clear up the problem of anti Semitism in the Labour Party, now is a good time to start. Withdraw that they're your friends. You're saying you use these words, friends. Now, are you saying they're not your friends, or are you saying, saying they are your friends? I'm saying that people I talk to 
I use it in a collective way, saying our friends were prepared to talk to. Does it mean I agree with Hamas and what it does? No. Does it mean I agree with Hezbollah and what they do? No. What it means is that I think to bring about a peace process, you have to talk to people with whom you may profoundly disagree. There is not going to be any peace process unless there is talks involving Israel, um, Hezbollah and Hamas. And I think well be everybody true. knows that. But as you know, the controversy is around you calling them friends. And you've explained, I think, that when you said that, you didn't mean that they're, fr they're friends. I used, is that, is that it, I used it in a collective yeah. way at a discussion, and you're trying to trivialise the whole no, issue of the Middle East. You're trying to trivialise the whole discussion about how you bring about a long-term peace process. I'm, I'm and you know happy, that. I'm very happy and to you know that. Know, quotes about friends has, has surfaced, and that's what I was asking you about, and you've, you've had your opportunity to... Well, thanks for the tabloid journalism. To answer, that's not tabloid journalism. Yes, it that, is. That's putting your own words back it's to you. It's tabloid saying... journalism where you're evading... You are evading asking me to give an opportunity to discuss well, the wider issue of the Middle East. Well, you know... Because all your Actually, what I was going to ask you next is was something the rather more said. important. No, it's I was tabloid ask you journalism something. and you know it. After Cameron was elected Tory leader, he persuaded a reluctant Johnson to stand as Mayor of London. But in London, it's his great friend who hates egalitarianism in every, with every pore of his body and supports inequality with every fibre of his being, Boris Johnson, who is actually bringing in traffic lights rather than roundabouts. Maybe you could have a word with him if you get membership of the Bullingdon Club. I'm sure they'd have you now. <laughs> they were elected members of the notorious Bullingdon Club, and they appeared together in the same photograph. The two men were elected Tory MPs for safe seats in the Cotswolds in 2001 and were fast rising up the greasy pole until Boris was sacked from the shadow front bench for lying about a love affair. We will give the British people a referendum with a very simple in or out choice to stay in the European Union on these new terms or to come out altogether. The Cabinet agreed that the government's position will be to recommend that Britain remains in a reformed European Union. When David Cameron took a gamble by calling the referendum, Boris Johnson had some sympathy for his view that it would be third time lucky for the Prime Minister. He had won the Scottish and the general election. We want our borders back. We want our passports back. We want our country back. The last thing I wanted uh, was to go against uh, David Cameron or the government. But after a great deal of, of heartache, I don't think there's anything else I can do. I will be advocating uh, vote leave. Mr. Thank, you thank you very much. Johnson had only given Cameron five minutes warning of his decision to back Brexit. Uh, and he told me he wasn't a lighter, I mean, some time ago. And he told lots of other people he wasn't a lighter. So I, I, I regret very much that he did it. There is to be a leadership election in the Conservative Party before the next election, because the Prime Minister already said that he's not going to stand down. Uh, and it is said, I'm told, that Boris intends to stand in that leadership election. I've been told by someone in a position to know that you wrote two articles for the, for the Daily Telegraph, because you knew you had to write, have an article in the Daily Telegraph on the Monday. One was for uh, staying in, the other was uh, for getting out. And the person who told me this said that the, the one for staying in was the more persuasive. In the Commons, the Prime Minister couldn't resist a subtle dig at Johnson's leadership ambitions. Mr Speaker, I am not standing for re-election. I have no other agenda. I have no other agenda than what is best for our country. To strengthen the Remain cause, Cameron had enlisted the most powerful man in the world to put the case against Brexit. But Johnson issued a preemptive strike, accusing Obama of being anti-British because of his part Kenyan origins. Obama delivered a magisterial rebuke. David Cameron seemed to be on a roll as he played up the economic cost for every household of Brexit. What comes first, World War III or the global Brexit recession? <laughs> Johnson now tried a bit of project fear of his own. He told The Telegraph that the Brussels bureaucrats were trying to unify Europe as Hitler had done before them. The Remain camp soon found that they had to contend with a simple but highly effective message from their opponents. But the Remain campaign 
thought they were on strong ground as they highlighted their opponent's claim about how much money the UK sends to the EU. The £350 million figure was, was devastatingly effective. Uh, the last thing that we wanted to do was to get into an argument uh, on television with the Leave campaign about whether the real figure was 350 million or 170 million or 210 million, because all those numbers sound, sound huge. Our challenge was to try to find a kind of a number that trumped it uh, as a number that captured the, the benefits of being in for our economy and for people and therefore the risks of leaving, and that we failed to do. A Leave campaign resorting to total untruths to con people into taking a leap in the dark. It is irresponsible, it is wrong, and it's time that the Leave campaign was called out on the nonsense that they are peddling. Don't make this choice on the basis of false information. Pete Khan called you a big fat liar. Paddy Ashdown did not dissent from that description. Are you a big fat liar? I and many others have been very critical of many decisions taken by the EU, and I remain very critical of its shortcomings from its lack of democratic accountability to the institutional pressures to deregulate or privatise public services. So, Europe needs to change. But that change can only come from working with our allies in the European Union to achieve it. The campaign to get Britain out of the common market was led by the Industry Secretary Tony Benn, the man of the people who'd first come up with the idea of the referendum. Unlike Roy Jenkins, Tony Benn refused to share a platform with members of other parties. Other leading anti-marketeers included Enoch Powell, whom Tony Benn had called a racist. Fleet Street was united in depicting Benn as the bogeyman of the No campaign. We had this bloody war which cost millions of lives and then we had to decide how we reacted to Europe. And I took the view that having fought them, we should now work with them and cooperate. And that was my first thought about it. Then when I saw how the European Union was developing, it was very obvious that what they had in mind was not democratic. I mean, in Britain, you vote for a government and therefore the government has to listen to you. And if you don't like it, you can change it. But in Europe, all the key positions are appointed, not elected. And the way that Europe has developed is that the bankers and the multinational corporations have got very powerful positions. And if you come in on their terms, they will tell you what you can and cannot do. And that is unacceptable. And my view about the European Union has always been, not that I'm hostile to foreigners, but I'm in favour of democracy. And I think out of this story, we'll have to find an answer because I certainly don't want to live in hostility to the European Union, but I think they're building an empire there and they want us to be a part of that empire. And I, don't, I don't want that. UKIP had unveiled a highly controversial poster. But, but perhaps, perhaps unwittingly, it did in the end get the debate back for the last few days onto the one thing that people out there really, really care about. The jury was told this was a cowardly attack. Jo Cox was attacked from behind and it was a brutal murder. She was shot three times and suffered multiple stab wounds. The prosecution said it was a planned and premeditated murder for a political or ideological cause. The jury heard the attack happened one week before the EU referendum. Joe Cox was a passionate campaigner for Remain. The court heard the evidence from a colleague of the MP who was with her at the time. During the course of the attack, she heard the defendant say, Britain first. This is for Britain. Britain will always come first. The two sides briefly suspended their campaigns after the death of Joe Cox, but hostilities resumed in time for the final television showdown days before the vote. For me, it was really clear during the preparation sessions for the TV debates. I was playing the role of Andrea Leadsom. What was really clear was that they had one simple phrase and they just kept repeating it. And it allowed them to have an answer to anybody's concerns over anything. Whether you fear for your job, whether you don't like the government, whether you have concerns over pressures on public services, vote leave, take back control. Really simple. 
The Remain side also believed that Jeremy Corbyn's less than enthusiastic support undermined their campaign. It was a nightmare not to have greater engagement from the leader of the Labour Party. Uh, the, the Labour Party made up the bulk of Remain voters. The first results and a sign of things to come. The northern working class city of Newcastle barely voting to remain in the European Union. And nearby Sunderland, a landslide vote to leave. The market's already sensing danger as those first returns start coming in. The hours pass, people staying up all night, their faces etched with anxiety, a whole country on edge. A night of great suspense, but we don't know what's going to happen, do we? And every hour made the pattern clearer. You can see it on the map. England and Wales voting to get out of the EU. London and the suburbs voting to stay. And Scotland and Northern Ireland overwhelmingly pro-EU. So Just before dawn, the we, BBC calls it. The British people have spoken and the answer is, we're out. For those who wanted to stay in the European Union, utter heartbreak. <laughs> But it was sweet, sweet victory for those like Nigel Farage, whose right-wing party fought for this moment for years. If Boris Johnson looks surprised and a little shaken hours after Vote Leave's historic victory, that's because he was. Newsnight understands that as voters went to the polls, Boris thought that his campaign was probably headed for defeat. He had even drafted a series of remarks in response to an expected narrow loss in the referendum. And the agony of defeat. Prime Minister David Cameron outside number 10 Downing Street, choking back emotion with the surprise announcement he would resign in the coming months. I love this country and I feel honored to have served it. It was an emotional campaign and immigration was a driving issue. This controversial poster capturing the feeling of so many. Some British voters may be having second thoughts. One of the top Google searches in the UK, what is the European Union? Voters asking what it is, they just left. Snapshots of racism captured in the days after the EU referendum. This sign left on a doorstep in Cambridgeshire. This banner on show in Newcastle city centre. And this abuse filmed on a train in Manchester. I've been here longer than you have. The message of hate scrawled on a West London Polish centre is the sort that's today been highlighted by a United Nations expert. Recorded hate crimes increased by nearly a third in 2016 compared to the previous year. Two years on, the graffiti is all but gone. But Barbara, who works inside the centre, says the racism remains. Nothing has really much changed. The only thing that changed is that people do not report them anymore because no one is talking about it anymore. The whole situation has become normalised. People have got used to hate crime. People got used to hate crime, hate incidents. People got used to the fact that they are being discriminated at work or that job offers are being withdrawn because they are Polish. Before, uh, people used to hesitate, s saying things like this, oh, this is our country, you cannot live here, go back and we will kick you out, but now it's, it's, there's no hesitation. Nigel Farage claims his party has no place for people with extreme views. But tonight, his Brexit party has been forced to sack two officials after an undercover investigation by this programme revealed shocking evidence of racism, violence and potential criminality. Our next Prime Minister, Jeremy Corbyn! To those that indulge in an orgy of xenophobia, of racist remarks and attacks against minorities, you think you've got a problem over <coughs> Excuse me. of school places, you think you've got a problem over local work, you think you've got a problem over housing, you may well have. You may well have a problem. You can expend a vast amount of energy abusing your next door neighbour because they're of a different nationality, because they, their family comes from a different part of the world. And you can create the most horrible atmosphere of hate, prejudice, nastiness and injustice within your community. And you know what? At the end of that, you've built not one house, trained one teacher, employed one nurse, built one school or anything else. Did you vote Leave? 
Now, of course I voted Remain. Why do you ask me the question? No, the conspiracy theory. Oh, you, you, know, you, you follow too many conspiracy theories. I've just you know heard that. people say that you've never been completely unequivocal and that it may be that you secretly voted... I voted for Remain, but I have made and continue to make criticisms of the EU. Surely you should be considering now your position and I'm maybe not... let somebody else take over. I've no idea where Lord Mandelson gets his analysis or his figures from. Uh, the issue is that some areas of the country that are very strong for Labour, such as London and Bristol, uh, voted overwhelmingly to remain. Other places that are also very strong for Labour, such as in the North East and much the North West, voted to leave. At the end of the day, the majority of Labour voters voted to remain. The vast majority of Conservative voters voted to leave. I'm not happy with that situation, but we've got to reach out to everybody. We've got to reach out to those communities that feel let down by Britain, let down by Europe and feel frankly they've been ignored ever since the destruction of the heavy industries by Margaret Thatcher's government in the 80s. Well much of that alienation is centred right here on Westminster and you are of Westminster, you made your plea, you like David Cameron failed, he's resigning, are you? No, I'm carrying on, I'm making the case for unity. Your party is split split most divisively over you. It is perfectly clear that the majority of Labour MPs want to get rid of you, and they say so. And who's done so today? Margaret Hodge, formerly a, a very prestigious MP in the House of Commons. And she's called for uh, a vote of confidence in you. For a great many of your MPs, it's about your performance. They talk about a chaotic performance. They say that you're simply incompetent as a leader. How unkind of them. Mm -hmm. The mass exodus began at 1.15am when Jeremy Corbyn had to sack the son of Tony Benn, his great political hero. Jeremy Corbyn's window sums up the criticism that his backing for Remain had been amateurish and shoddy. I travelled the length and breadth of this country. I did meetings in every major city. I did no end of factory meetings, college meetings, university meetings, and I did put the case across. Mr Corbyn, how can you survive in the wake of so many resignations from your front bench? Thank you very much. How can you survive? Thank you very much. It emerged today that Downing Street had begged Corbyn to share a platform with David Cameron and to do all he could to get out the Labour vote. They even thought of getting Barack Obama to ask Corbyn. Don't bother, number 10 was told, no one will change his mind. Health spokeswoman Heidi Alexander then went of her own accord. I felt the only decent and honourable thing to do um, was to resign. Gloria De Piero quit next, then Ian Murray. With four more names gone by lunchtime, Corbyn's friends fought back, saying he'd already won elections. Local government elections, we matched Ed Miliband at his very highest. Wow, you will not win a general election we, we, and by matching Ed well, Miliband. We've laid the foundations to win the next general election, full stop. This autumn, you've yes. laid the foundation. Bring it on, what, bring it on. What, what planet are you from? Bring it on. Look at the electoral tests we've had. We've matched them all and won them, increased our majorities on every parliamentary by-election. We think if we hold together, work hard... But you're not holding together. Well, that's the problem. That's why I'm really disappointed. When the Tories are in disarray, when the government is in non-existent, when our country is facing a really perilous situation, we need to negotiate a decent deal with, with Europe. This is not the time for internal party squabbles. A third of his shadow cabinet, 10 faces out of 31. His critics say more will follow and junior members of the team as well. Rarely, if ever, has a British party leader lost so many senior colleagues in one day. This week, sadly, there has been more evidence that racist incidents are increasing. Evidence collated by monitoring groups shows that in the last three or four days alone, attacks and abuse from Stoke to Stockton, from Dorset to the Clyde. Can I ask the Prime Minister what monitoring systems he and the Home Secretary have put in place, what reports he's received from the police, and what extra resources are going to communities that have been targeted in these vile racist attacks that are taking place? The Prime Minister has two months left. Will he leave a one-nation legacy? And will that one nation legacy and will that one nation legacy be the scrapping of the bedroom tax, the banning of zero hours contracts and cancelling of the cuts to universal credit? Where, where I would agree with the right hon gentleman is of course 
We need to do more to tackle poverty. We need to do more to spread wealth and opportunity. But to try and pretend that last Thursday's vote was a result of the state of the British economy is complete nonsense. The British economy is incomparably stronger than it was six years ago. We all have to reflect on our role in the referendum campaign. I know the Honourable Gentleman says he put his back into it. All I'd say is I'd hate to see him when he's not trying. Government, government figures released yesterday show the number of children living in poverty has jumped by 200,000 in a year to a total now, a disgraceful total, of 3.9 million children in this country living in poverty. Does he not think he should at the very least apologise to them and the parents that have been failed by his government and do something about it so that we do reduce the levels of child poverty in this country? Well, if he wants to deal with the figures, let me give them to him. Income and inequality has gone down. Average incomes have grown at their fastest rate since 2001. He asks about poverty. There are 300,000 fewer people in relative poverty since 2010. Half a million fewer people in absolute poverty since 2010. Look, if he's looking for excuses about why the side he and I were on about the referendum, frankly, he should look somewhere else. And I have to say to the honourable gentleman, he talks about job insecurity and my two months to go. It might be in my party's interest for him to sit there. It's not in the national interest. And I would say, for heaven's sake, man, go. Um, 95% turnout among MPs, which is very high. Overwhelming number of MPs there deciding that they don't back uh, Jeremy Corbyn. 172 against him and backing that motion of no confidence. He's in charge at the moment, but with a leadership crisis, the party's divided and struggling to find its direction. This man says he has the answers and has taken on the leader head to head for the first time. This Cardiff hustings a chance for the candidates to outdo each other. To prove their leadership will give Labour its next best chance. It was a question about division in the party that revealed once more the gulf between Jeremy Corbyn and his MPs. It would be a good thing if Labour MPs got behind their leader and um, worked with them rather than uh, briefed against them all the time. I understand political differences and I understand dissent. But Jeremy, 172 Labour MPs voted no confidence in your leadership. Now, they're not red Tories. These aren't people who want to see the Tories back in power. They're not Blairites. They're just Labour MPs. As for taking the fight to the Tories, Jeremy Corbyn insisted he'd already been successful. In the past 10 months, we've defeated the government 22 times in Parliament. When we work together, we win. When we work together, we do defeat the Tories. Thank you very much. But Owen Smith repeated time and time again, Labour needed to be not just in opposition, but a radical government in waiting. Well, I think the problem with that, Jeremy, is we're not defeating the Tories. We've had a few victories. We've done relatively well on a few occasions. But we're behind. We're behind. You just pick up the papers today. We're 14 percentage points behind the Tories. At points, it was personal. Allegations of anti-Semitism have dogged the Labour Party in recent times. And Mr Smith's comments on this drew both cheers and jeers from party members. I've been in this Labour Party for 30 years. I've only remembered in the last nine months a discussion about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. That's the truth. That's the truth. Mr Corbyn condemned all forms of anti-Semitism. I want our party to be the inclusive, open, welcoming place for everybody, whatever their faith, whatever their ethnic group, whatever their community they come from. There is one major policy where the pair disagree, Trident. It got the biggest response from the audience tonight. I voted against the renewal of Trident. And... Must retain a nuclear deterrent in order to enable the multilateral disarmament of the entire world's arsenal. That is the unfortunate, terrible truth. Whoever wins the leadership contest, the deep divisions now entrenched in the Labour Party will not be easily healed. Labour win on the Jeremy Corbyn? No. 
that it becomes that you are hurting us more than you are helping us, I will, I won't knife you in the back, I'll knife you in the front. Jeremy Corbyn's foot soldiers are busy fighting their second leadership battle in only a year. For them, their leader has lost none of his luster. Not many things make me feel proud to be a Brit, but he makes me feel quite proud and I just feel like he cares about everyone. He has the policies that I agree with, um, you know, including an end to um, tried and, and bringing in um, an end to austerity and an increasing investment in our infrastructure, things like that, because a lot of people are suffering and Jeremy knows what's best for people like me. I am confident that Jeremy Corbyn will come out as a leader of Labour as well as our next Prime Minister at number 10. As you can see, enthusiasm here in York, at least, for Jeremy Corbyn appears absolutely undiminished. They're expecting about a thousand people here tonight, and it's hard to imagine another politician for whom that could be said. For example, a certain Owen Smith, just down the road in Leeds last night, managed to attract a mere 200 to one of his first rallies. Thanks so much for being here tonight. This is the biggest crowd of this year's leadership campaign. I just received a message. Send them my best wishes. From one Scouser in exile to my fellow Scousers at home in the finest city in the world. That's from John McDonnell. In Parliament and outside, we've won quite a few things. In fact, you won't have read this in most of the papers, this Tory government has been defeated 22 times in the past year alone. What is it about Tory Britain? Too many children being brought up in grossly overcrowded, badly maintained, expensive, damp, short-term, private rented accommodation across this country. It was the Tories under Thatcher that started the destruction of council housing and instead replacing it with a free market dogma. I tell you this. I want a Labour government that says our priority is to ensure by the end of that first term of that government, everyone is decently, securely and properly housed within our society. At the battle for the soul of the Labour Party, the leader, Jeremy Corbyn, adored by his supporters, it's not about an individual, it's about what we collectively as a society want to do and want to achieve. One of the reasons Labour members are very angry is they feel that, not that long ago, a few months ago, about 60% of them voted for Jeremy Corbyn to be leader of the Labour Party. In terms of, as an open democratic contest, you could say people like John Smith got a higher percentage, but as an open democratic contest, this was the greatest mandate uh, of a Labour Party leader. And just a few months down the road, there's this undemocratic coup staged by the Parliamentary Labour Party against the members' own interests. And many of those people think you're part of this pre-planned coup against the democratic wishes of the, par of, of, the, of the party membership. This morning that you're making your mission to stop the split of the Labour Party. That's why you're standing as leader. But at the same time, you're also saying that if you aren't elected, that the party will burst apart and disappear. I want our party to continue to grow, to hold the government to account, but above all, to unite around the idea that we bring all of our communities together so that no one and no community is ever left behind again. My worry with Jeremy is that he's too satisfied with being in opposition oh. and not hungry enough to be in power to change things. Oh, 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 hang on, hang on. There's a few people sort of booed and hissed there. This seems to be a feature of some of these things. Who, who was booing? I just want to explain why they were just booing. You were booing, madam. Yeah. Oh, I'm just so angry Corbyn. at what the rest of the Labour Party are doing to Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. I think yeah. they're cowards. Yeah. I think they're cowards. They're old Blairites. Everybody hates Tony oh, Blair. Yeah. 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 I mean... Well, I'll, I'll let you guys debate well, that let, point. Let me come back on that. I mean, we, uh, Tony Blair did pass the grammar school ban that you back. Yeah, but that's but one hated. thing he did. What about all the rest of the things he did? They sold Why, the Labour Party out. The yeah. centrist Labour Party are rubbish. We don't want them. They're no good to this country. Yeah. Now, do, do you agree with Senator Can I, can I, can I, I maybe know, respond to that, Pfizer? Because it was, well, directed, it it was just directed at me, obviously. Okay, go on. Go on. And then well, we'll let Jeremy Corbyn come back well, in. Well, all I would say is herein lies part of the problem we've got in the party right now, that we've become so deeply divided. Because I don't agree with you that 
everybody hates Tony Blair. And I don't agree with you that Tony Blair didn't do much for this country. I think the reality is a minimum wage, trebling spending on the NHS, introducing sure start, paternity rights, maternity rights, making sure that we had an Equalities Act, a Human Rights Act in this country. You know, these were massive steps forward for Britain, getting rid of grammar schools. I, I was actually in Parliament. Kidd, no, hang on, hang on. Let's, let's, I was let's actually in call. Parliament throughout the whole period from 1997. All the things you just mentioned, I voted for. Yeah. I voted for the Human Rights Act, the Equalities Act, Sure Start, the minimum wage. If you read what George Orwell wrote about anti-Semitism in the 1920s and 1930s, if you think of the Dreyfus Affair and what went on there, anti-Semitism was rife throughout very large sections of society in many parts of Europe. It is utterly and totally wrong in any circumstances. And I am determined that it will stop totally and altogether. But we don't uh, uh, welcome in your party anymore. Well, I hope you are welcome in our party because I welcome you into the party. And I want the party to be welcoming to all people of all faiths. Can we be very serious and very responsible about this? There are some people that have made anti-Semitic statements, remarks, have been suspended from party membership. Some of those, the most of them, actually predate my leadership. As you know, I received reports, I was concerned, and I asked Shami Chakrabarti to undertake an inquiry into this, which she did. She's proposed a series of rule changes as well as an information and education program within the party, which uh, will help. And I propose that we bring those things through this year and that we review the whole process next year to make sure that we are getting rid of any vestige whatsoever of anti-Semitism within our party. And I'm sure you will agree with me on that. Harris is just over there. Chris. In the last 40 years, Labour has achieved its greatest electoral success as a centrist party. Why do you think a move away from the centre is the best way forward? How about we set the agenda of saying we want to create an inclusive society with equality of opportunity for all and not be ashamed of saying there is a role, a huge role, for the public, for the state, in provision of housing, health and education. This government is systematically handing all of our public services over to the private sector. If you call it left-wing, to say that we think nobody should be homeless, if you think it's left-wing to say we don't want selective education, we want inclusive, comprehensive education, then that is allowing somebody else to set our agenda. After this leadership election is over, the party has to come together. Come together to offer something different. A society that is environmentally sustainable, that provides full employment for all, that invests, not detracts from our economy, and above all, a society that works for the good of all. So we reduce and remove the levels of grotesque inequality in Britain, so that we invest in all those places that desperately need it. And as a party, we bring communities together in strength to bring about that decent, fair society that works for all, so that no one no community and no part of Britain is ever left behind again in the way that this Tory government is doing that, doing that and treating them. I am therefore conference delighted to declare Jeremy Colburn elected as leader of the Labour Party. Thatcher got rid of all the industry. She kicked the life out of working people because there was no work there and people want to work. Margaret Thatcher said there's no such thing as society. Everyone is responsible for themselves. No one is responsible for anybody else, which is totally alien to the way I was brought up. It was like any build-up to a big game. One aspect of the struggle for justice for the victims of the 1989 Hillsborough disaster. Both banners were made as part of the campaign against the lies printed by the Sun newspaper about this tragedy. This newspaper was very closely associated with the Conservative government at the time, and in particular its Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Four days after the disaster on 19th of April 1989, underneath a banner headline, The Truth, half of the Sun's front page was given over to three bullet-pointed claims. Some fans pick pockets of victims, 
Some fans urinated on the brave cops. Some fans beat up PC giving kiss of life. Lurid and inaccurate stories followed, quoting police sources. It fueled the toxic atmosphere, and families believed that when it came to dealing with officialdom, they paid a devastating price. <laughs> Inside the tower, it was like a war zone. Dark heat, pitch black, toxic smoke. He looked like he was just sleeping, as the babies do. The statement said his father never disappointed anyone. My dad is dearly loved and he is sorely missed. Because night brings silence, and silence brings tears of sadness. There will be two empty chairs on the table for every birthday, Christmas, and New Year's, but they will forever own a position in our hearts. Mrs May finds herself in a very difficult situation because if we look at past tragedies, and we must tread carefully because there are now charges, but a lot of the Thatcher government, the way it responded to the Hillsborough tragedy, it marked or it coloured how everybody viewed that government because, let's be polite, it was fairly inept. She is at a real turning point now. This is a woman who sought to make that assurance that you've just played out on television. The, literally, the hours are running down. And it seems very strange to me, again, without scoring points, but... She was able to do a deal with the DUP for a billion pounds in, I think, about 12 days. She hasn't been able to house these, house these people. And my listeners and your viewers think this is wholly unfair. Oh, Now, there have been suggestions that, in part, the tragedy was caused by either racism or policies of class. Are these suggestions correct? I don't think so. I think it, the, the tragedy came about because of the cladding leading to the fire racing up the building and then was compounded by the stay-put policy. And uh, it seems to me that that is the tragedy of it, that the more one's read over the weekend about the report and about the chances of people surviving, if you just ignore what you're told and leave, you are so much safer. And uh, I, I think if either of us were in a fire, whatever the fire brigade said, we would leave the burning building. It just seems the common sense thing to do.